uh, first and foremost on the topic of um, ACL injuries and injury prevention, Doc Joan and I have uh, worked on creating a documentary. Rachel will put it in the chat. It will be available to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> very interesting. Use it as a resource. Share it with people. Um, any questions you have, please, again, as Rachel said, put the questions in the chat. We'll get to it. Um, I, I think the, fir the first one, I'm going to throw it out to both of you. I was reading an article just yesterday. Then I saw an article the day before what, that what, talking about why are ACL injuries so common in women's football and why are women six times more likely, if that's an accurate statistic, likely to suffer an ACL injury than their counterparts? Dr. Arman. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think um, if you compare, let's say, like the researches that have been done in the past comparable to now, um, a lot of people, what they focus on is just strengthening specific group of muscles and they forget about the entire body. Um, a lot of times when you look at specific muscles that cause an ACL injury, um, and, you know, we, we gave a little talk at the school about this. A lot of people didn't realize that it's the mainly looking at the hamstrings. Um, if you just strengthen your quads, you still need to go and do the hamstrings. The hamstrings are the back muscles of the back of the thigh. And people don't concentrate a lot more on that. Now, for women, it, it becomes a little bit of a bigger role because, you know, as, 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 we, as women age, uh, from let's say from their teens and on, everything changes, the body changes. So the strengthening becomes a key issue uh, with prevention in these type of uh, specifics. Doc Joan, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly multifactorial. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the structural differences of girls versus boys. Um, you know, girls tend to have a wider pelvis, so that changes the way, you know, the you know, the, the femur or the upper leg bone comes into knee, which then changes the way the lower leg goes into the foot, which then affects the foot, which is, you know, people say, why is, as a podiatrist, are you interested in ACL injuries? And, and I, you know, there, I think it, it started, Brandy, with so many young girls coming over to us, you know, who, and moms, you know, saying, like, you know, my daughter has ACL, or is my life over now? And so a lot of it was just trying to, educate people who've suffered these injuries that that you know what recovery is like and and then go to the other side with injury prevention so um so like like um like like Arma was saying it's just a multifactorial thing um there's definitely structural differences hormonal differences and people look into you know a lot of these a lot of these things how does estrogen affect affect ligaments um so um, there's not one specific thing, but many little things that come together that make girls so much more likely to suffer these injuries than boys. So, so Dr. Armand, with that being said, and you know, that's a reality. These are, these are not things we can say like, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, we, we don't know. Right. You right. know, I, I never assumed that I would take an injury, um, what are some of the best practices that either you are instituting with the teams that you're working with or that you've you've come across that you'd like to share with our group today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was, uh, I'll give you an example, when I was traveling with um, the Armenian women's uh, team, uh, it was my you know first time doing um, that specifically with the women's clubs. Um, it was, you know, I, I usually like to sit down and talk to the girls and, and just, just find out a little bit about their history from the past, uh, what they've had, how they have trained, what is their daily routine, you know, how their nutrition is, uh, what do they, what time do they eat and what time do they train? Uh, you just got to take all that in factor. Uh, we put a little program together and then specifically we tell athletes, okay, this, when you're training, you got to make sure your nutrition is, is in par specifically a couple of hours here and there. And then afterwards, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer, you know, in nutrition and, and hydration and during, after practices, games and all that stuff. So we make sure we tell them to warm up properly. And when we say warm up, they don't have to go and start doing these crazy stretching exercises, right? They just can do a light jug, um, 
then just do a little light warm ups. And then from that point on, you let the muscles kind of open up. And when you let the muscles open up, the blood flows going, then it eases up on, 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 on strengthening eventually during practices and during eventually games. Are there any specific uh, exercises that you believe are truly impactful for prevention or maybe sustainability? I mean, I, I think there's, I think you could go online. We could all probably go. Oh, yeah, you, you can go online. There are, but there's specifically, I put down like a whole list of like 10. Uh, one of them was uh, that I really like is the, uh, I, I like using like the bands, the, the lateral, it's called the lateral brand, uh, band walking. Uh, so people put the bands around their ankles and they just do a lateral walking that strengthens a lot of the um, ligaments around the knee as well as the ankle. So you're just covering the lower extremity entirely as well as your hip. Uh, the other one is the, it's called a goblet squat. And, and then that's a goblet squat is a pretty good one as well, too. Uh, single leg um, glute bridge is another great one uh, to do, which is it's called the hip thrusters. Um, and the other one is the back extension by doing a what's called a reverse um, reverse hypers. Uh, those top ones um, are going to increase it. The other thing that a lot of uh, athletes don't focus on is their cores. Uh, so we do with something that's called forearm planks, and the forearm planking has been known. Instead of doing push-ups uh, or sit-ups, people start doing more forearm planking, and that planking strengthens their abdominal cores, which will uh, lessen the tension to the lower extremity muscles in the in the lower back. Doc, we have a question in um, in the chat from Kim, and it says, "What role do new cleat shapes have in injuries?" My twelve year old daughter recently switched to a brand with square shaped cleats and immediately had injuries, pain, back to normal, and all was fine. Yeah. Um, we had the same exact type of issue with our, our, our uh, team's uh, um, players. And when they noticed the switch in the type of uh, uh, cleats, uh, specifically where they have the studs in, in different shape and variations, you know, we didn't have these type of things in the past, right? In let's say 80s and 90s, these things kind of trickled on as they're changing the gears, as they're over strengthening certain things. But I think uh, one thing that can be done, it's, it's just stick to whatever boots, uh, cleats you've played with in the past. I I like the uh, the Nikes. Um, they have simple studs on there. They're not too wide on the bottom. Specifically, those studs are the square ones. If you have any score ones, they're putting too much pressure on those uh, on the sides. Doc Joan, um, what's your, your well, take on that? You know, it, it's... Cleats are always an interesting topic. So one, one of the things I say, young kids, young girls try to emulate their heroes, right? So whatever they see, you know, people on, you know, the national team wearing, they want that. And of course they, they, they come brighter and, and, and cooler looking. You know, with, with, with young kids, I would rather see them in turf shoes because they don't really need the benefit of, shoe, of cleats most of the time. Because remember, the, the cleats are going to have a stiffer sole. It's a it's a it's a TPU sole, so it's a, it's a plastic sole versus turf shoes, which are going to be rubber. Plus, from from the other standpoint, when, with you know, in our world, when we see kids with with foot issues, we have more room to provide some treatment options, you know, with orthotics and things inside of of turf shoes. They can work with cleats, but it's a little more challenging to do that. And I know. Um, you know, fit it always becomes an issue, you know, higher level players, Brandy, you could speak to it certainly even better than I can. You just don't like any room in the boot. They want, they want that boot to be extension of their foot. And we as doctors are going, well, no, we want, we want a little bit of room. We don't want too much stress, especially in the midfoot, you know, where, you know, there's just, there's just no way for us to do much to accommodate the stress that the foot's undergoing. But I think for young kids starting out, I think try to keep them in turf for a while. So I think that, that, that answers or gets to the crust of our, one of our women in soccer, um, I, I would say posse, uh, Maria Mernan, because she's constantly asking me, should I wear cleats or should I wear turfs? And so I think what you're saying, even though you said young kids, I think you're saying that if you have a choice, if you have the opportunity to choose between the two and you have both, that turfs 
for the surface. It, yeah. and it's for turf fields only, or are you talking about no, for grass? It's, not just it's on grass, unless it's a particularly wet, you know, situation where you really need the traction. Uh, for you know, um, you know, un unless you're a very high level player, I think turf shoes will will do the job for you. Okay, so we have another question, um, Dr. Arman, about the uh, frequency of how often we should be doing these strength and core exercises. Is this daily? Is it multi-daily? Is it weekly? What do you think? I mean, I know we're all different, so this yeah. is like it's very hard to put a specific specific answer to a general question but uh, in best practices what would you say yeah usually if you're putting um, so it's going to vary if you're let's say um, off season or in season okay or after the season so if you're uh the season hasn't started uh i would you usually do uh strengthening and these type of uh, stretching exercises um five days a week so let's say you go monday through friday you give the weekend off then you start again in season, it kind of becomes less. So you start doing it between two to three times um, and as needed um, for that specific things. Uh, before games, I, we have all our players do that lateral band walking um, in the locker rooms just to open up their muscle groups. So it's one of the things that can be done. In the off season, and I usually, after the players recover from our long season like that they have a specific month where they just do nothing but let's say jogging and and endurance and things like that then they go back to from two to three day increasing to five days a week yeah it's, well, it's, it's interesting though because because some of some of the science is actually shows so the goal for training is going to be neuromuscular training right it's exactly. not it, it's the nerve you know it's the muscles but it's the nerves innervating you know those muscles and a lot of them are talking about three times a week that they, they've shown significant improvement in growth of nerve and muscle, you know, uh, in three times a week training. And again, I think it's going to vary for the elite, you know, athlete, you know, may want to do more than that. But I don't I don't think kids have to be overwhelmed with how much they have to do, you know, on, on top of, you know, playing and, 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 and homework and everything else they're doing. And a lot of this I think com comes back to trying to make it fun and, and uh, do things that are not just work, but th these can be done in a really fun way and become part of everyday life. And that's one of the things I think, you know, we showed some examples of that even the, in the documentary for injury prevention. These are not things you have to you know, go schedule, go to a gym, you know, these are things you can do at home with, you know, everything, you know, you, that you have around you, elastic bands, you know, you can do, uh, you can do weights, but you can do free weights and you can do kettlebells and things, you know, you, you and I may do watching television at home and it becomes, I think the goal is to not make it one more thing you schedule in your life, but something that you do every day and it becomes fun, you know, like, you know, we, uh, we talked about it before, like brushing your teeth on one leg and doing squats, you know, <laughs> going, and, and, and I do show up sometimes with toothpaste on the top of my, my, my I, I, I go, you know, I show up, what's that on your scrub? I was like, oh, I was jumping t too much. <laughs> you know, well, but, I, but, it, but honestly, it becomes fun for me and something I don't think yeah. if I have to schedule one more thing in my life, I will not do it. But if yeah. I can talk into everything I do and have fun with it, or if I'm going to reward myself with watching television for an hour, you know, I may be doing planks while I'm watching it. You know, I think it just, I think to me, that's the message is make it part of your everyday life and not one more thing you have to schedule. And, and I like that because I, as um, Dr. Armand began talking about seasons, I thought life is a season. Yeah. Like yeah. R the reality is that not everybody's going to fall into a, you know, I have a specific season for soccer or, you know, maybe we just want to be active and we want to play pickup games when we have a chance. And right, I think right. that's another time when we can really be vulnerable. But if we take on the advice, I think that you're saying, Doc Joan, which is integrate these things in a way that are interesting and fun. And now all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're feeling stronger, you're feeling more in balance, you're feeling more aware um to me that you know I, that's how i like to do it because 
like you said, one more thing in the schedule is like going to tip the scale to like it ain't happening. So I, I, I like that a lot. Um, we have a question um, from Caitlin talking about um, thoughts on FIFA's 11 plus warm up for competitive youth teams. I don't know if either one of you have seen this um, or not. And if you have, if you have any comments um, that you'd like to share. I, I like it, you know, um, and I think that, and the point is, again, you incorporate this into your practices with your players, but you don't have to incorporate, you know, all 11, every, every single practice, but a lot of it also is a social, a social aspect to it where you're tossing the ball back and forth to your friend, your teammate. Uh, but then while you're doing that, you're doing some movements that provide strength timing at the same time. And again, those little movements go back to what we were talking about, the muscular education it's just the, it's it's all working on the same thing and when you can do it part of the practice where you may have some some ball handling skills but also some things that you're just engaging socially with your teammate i think it's great anything yeah. to add on that, dr Arman? yeah i i 100 agree with that i think uh, like john was pointing out that neuromuscular training and balancing i think that's huge uh, i think that's what that was was lacking in the past you know, a lot of people researching wise, we're not concentrating on that. And, you know, what we're referring by neuromuscular balancing is pretty much like training balance. It's you just balance everything. Your body needs to be in, in, in sync with it. But I, I firmly believe I think they did a really good job in inter, intervening a lot of the things together. And sometimes, you know, people looking at that will be will be a big benefit. Yeah, I, I, I like to take things to the next level like you, Doc, whether it's you're holding a gallon of milk and you're balancing on one foot and you're trying to pour a cup of water or something like, I don't know. It just, well, I can't, and we I can't have, get enough competition in my life. I guess. We have some examples, like, like you said, if you don't have a kettlebell, a kettle, right. you know, we, we have examples of you using, you know, a gallon of milk and just, just using that. So you, whatever you have in your house, you can use. So it, I, I wrote down something, um, as this pertained to me in the two different ACL injuries that, that, um, that I had, what is the physiological or neuromuscular difference between a contact injury and a non-contact injury? You know, we see, you know, for most of the folks that are on this call, they will have been watching women's soccer or men's soccer or soccer in general. And the announcer will say, Oh, he's gone down on his own. That's never a good thing. Or, Oh, he got hit in that moment or she got hit in that moment. And, you know, that that looks bad. But when we're not sure, like, can you can you differentiate those two moments? And um, and then I have some questions to follow up on that. Well, the, the, the history of going back to ACL injuries, I think, is what you're talking about. Right. You know, the history. We talked about that a little bit when you. Um, uh, uh, Talk to Dr. Dillingham, you know, in the in the in that movie that you know historically these were contact injuries in in, in football, you know, um, men's, men's actual football, and um, and then it's kind of changed over the years where most ACL injuries are non-contact. Uh, so they're you know basically we consider them you know movement injuries. It's most commonly you know when you're changing direction it, it's when you're cutting you know when you're 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 going straight and then you have to make that sh that sharp turn that's when the acl is on tension and again the reason we talk about muscle strengthening is that like like armin was saying earlier that that hamstring is what's this the first line of defense when you're making that movement and if the hamstring's weak it's not stopping the the, the tibia the leg bone from translating so then the, the ligament, which is just going for the ride, gets on stretch and it tears. So that's why the you know strengthening the muscle around the joint is the answer. But but it's it's uh, jumping injuries and turning injuries. So jumping, mm -hmm. you know, you know, girls tend to jump differently than boys, you know, that's and and it's just that girls tend to not absorb shock as well. So there's less hip less hip bend and there's less knee bend. So again, now the ligament comes on, under tension. So that's why a lot of this, we keep, you know, kind of hammering down, go back to the muscle. You're not going to strengthen a ligament, but you're going to strengthen the muscles that protect the joint and therefore protect the ligament. Dr. Arman? 
Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Uh, it's uh, it's something that people don't realize when they talk about the ACL. You know, how do you strengthen the ACLs? Well, you, you can't. You just have to strengthen things around it. It's just the foundation is there, but you, you got to build around it. And some people, what they do is just, let's say they, they start working out a specific muscle group, but they forget. You know, we had the freak injuries, like John was pointing out, jumping up and coming down. A lot of the basketball players, soccer players, when they got for the headers, right? Basketball players go up for the layups and the dunks. Uh, as they come down, you know, as soon as that leg lands, sometimes it can hyperextend. And as it hyperextends, that's what makes pressure to the ACL. And some of those are little freak injuries. But uh, overall, you're right. It, it's been an increase in, in people uh, when they're not getting hit. Uh, those type of injuries in football can't be prevented because that's just the na natural ability of, 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 the, of, the, of the sport. Uh, but the, the, the most freakest injuries are the ones that are non-contact ones. And, and we always say, oh, my God, this person went down. And we automatically know it's either an ACL or, or an Achilles or things like that. Do we, what is a, a variable that we can control that's in the equation uh, for these young players or even, let, let's say, even elite players? You know, there's there's been a lot of discussion amongst um, high-level players about the amount of games that they're playing. Uh, I don't know if it's amount of games versus the training, game, you know, sessions. You know, what do you say about the modern athlete and the amount of exposure to these opportunities for injury in terms of training and games, does that have a significant place in, in the equation or, or not? I, I think for things like ACL injuries, it, it would not necessarily make a difference, but what we worry about is overuse injuries. And that's not specific for soccer. We're seeing that a lot, you know, a lot in the tennis world where there's, there's no off season. So these athletes are going week to week to week and especially the mid to lower level, you know, tennis player is going after points. So they feel the pressure that they can't skip a week. And that's when we're seeing more and more uh, overuse injuries. But wouldn't you say that the, in the overuse, you basically get to a point where you become more vulnerable because now your muscles are exhausted or, they're just not firing in the manner that they would if they were fresh. So, I mean, obviously everything's connected as you, you, you're doctors, you know that. I mean, we, we go from feet up, right? Our foundation up, exactly. but um, yeah, so that, that is, um, so I, so I guess what I'm hearing is I'm taking that in right now as a coach, my responsibility is to my players to make sure that they're always safe, number one. And I think that's a part of what this wellness series will also um, focus on our highlight, which is, you know, it's not just the physical wellness of the player, it's the mental wellness of the player. Um, and so how do we, if we have, if we are in seasons that are pretty like, Hey, you, there's no off season. What do we do? What, what, what are some of the things coaches can do? The question is, is the, is the audience typically dealing with you know, uh, competitive athletes or are these more recreational athletes, you know, and because it'd be slightly different answer. Yeah, I, I mean, if you want to break them down differently, you can, but I'm going to say that I think the landscape of youth soccer or youth sports has become competitive and whether that's you're getting competitiveness from your parents or, com you know, the pressure from your coaches or the club or your school, there, there, it exists no matter where you are. So how do we, how do we manipulate or nap? That's, that's a whole session we should do just on that too. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I think, I think it, there's still, you know, coaching is more than X's and O's, right? And, and I think knowing the athlete and watching the athlete and seeing what the athlete's going through, especially the student athlete, because some of these kids may be coming off of exams. They may, de they may be tired. And when you're tired is when you get injured, you know. So so I think it's having that awareness and having that relationship and the the, the open communication with these, these athletes that they feel comfortable saying. Because there's so much pressure, you know, on these kids nowadays. And, you know, and the parents, you know, look, I, I remember even coaching, you know, one of my my sons in a, you know, like a, in, a, in a comp team. This was even, it's not the highest level of junior, 
you know, uh, soccer teams and the parents were just screaming at the kids and pushing the kids and don't slow down. And, you know, and I think the coach has to really be comfortable enough to be that person and, and not have the parents be the ones shouting at the kids, but, but, you know, intervene and watch them and it's okay for them to rest, you know, and if they look like they're slowing down and they're struggling, pull them out. Don't, don't make them push through because that's when they'll get injured. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with that. I, I, we build a relationship with the coaches, you know, you know, professional staff or in a nice dog. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and, Sometimes the coaches, you know, we talk and we say, oh, yeah, what do you think this should this player play 50 minutes, 15 minutes, 65 minutes? You know, everybody's different. Everybody's body is different. So you just have to know that player. And that's why it takes the chemistry of building the team perspective takes a long time to do that. And, you know, off season is the time where we kind of collaborate and, and make these type of things known. Um, but primarily when you're looking at these kind of stuff and I, I agree, Jonah, it's 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 person player uh variant you know i think younger yes the parents coaches sometimes push them to kind of yes just just suck it in and just push it through right and that's when we see the higher number of injuries come on uh for these type of players yeah i again there there's so many variables but again i think as the adults in the room we have to make sure that we're giving our youth players especially the support they need to mm -hmm. Be what I think you said, Dr. Joan, which is aware, right? Having a relationship with your body, understanding to the cues that it's that it's sending. Because uh, what I learned through my multiple years of uh, rehabilitation and getting back onto the field is that your body is not going to lie to you, right? It's not going to tell you something and then be like, ha, 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 I'm just kidding. It's going to tell you it's tired. It's going to tell you uh, it, it, it hurts. And there's a difference between injury and, and being uncomfortable. And, you know, being able to navigate that, the space in between, I think is really important. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think coaches need maybe even to learn more about and how to help athletes take that journey through that space. I think that's really critical. And again, to your point, Joan, that's probably – its own conversation, but that maybe gets into the mental um, health and wellness of the athlete and where they are. But you said something also about sleeping and have you seen any studies about sleep and wellness and injuries? And if so, can you share? Me? Are you Either one. So, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, information coming out now where, you know, it, it's, the encouraging thing, you know, we're, we're transitioning to a world where talking about mental illness is okay. And we look, we don't look at the athlete, whether it's a youth athlete or a professional athlete, strictly, well, more so than the youth athlete, strictly as an, as an, as an entity, but, it, but more of a holistic approach and understanding that these other factors affect their performance on the field, you know? And I think giving these kids permission to say they're struggling again because when you know when i was growing up you pushed through everything and i think probably similar to you brandy you know, you know not that i'm comparing oh player, for but. sure <laughs> no but but the cult the culture was that you did not complain you never admitted that you were struggling and you pushed through and that's when we see the injuries happening you know so so giving these athletes permission to to open up about their struggling, that they couldn't sleep, that they had an exam, you know, that their things are going on at home. You know, we, we, we look, we're, we're there. What is, what is, especially what is youth sports doing you know, for, for most, most of us? It's creating incredible people with skills that will carry them on and enhance their lives, you know, for the rest of their lives. So we can't have this myopic look that, you know, I need them in there because they're my goal scorer. And if I don't get in, we, we, you know, so, so what, you know, so what we have to think about the athlete first and then long-term they're going to perform 10 times better because you gave them that time off. Anything to add, Dr. Roman? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, giving a, a break between events, uh, practices, I think it's super important. I, I'm, I really believe in, in, in resting as far as like sleep cycles go. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, 
even growing up, youths, um, they have to have a specific number of hours of sleep or else the functionality translates on either to the field or even the ability of test taking. But if they have those specific things going, yeah, give them a break, give them a day or two break. It's, there's nothing wrong with that, absolutely. Uh, I have to say that, you know, sleep has become something that is, I'm recognizing as being one of the, the most impactful factors when I don't sleep well, it's uh, very difficult for, you know, to have that smooth day. Um, and I have to admit, I was not, and I'm still not really a great sleeper. I think when I was training with the national team and playing during those first Olympics and even 99 for the World Cup, I mean, I was a three hours a night, four hours a night kind of sleeper. Um, and so I think that there's something there. This is a, um, this is a plug uh, I'm going to do. I, I am working with a pillow company, so uh, I will tell you. Uh, it's called Mummy Sleep, uh, M-V-M-I. If you want to check it out, if you're looking for a pillow that, you know, that might help you sleep better, it definitely is working for me. So that that is, uh, thank you, Rachel, for saying okay to that. I appreciate it. Uh, Nikki um, made a comment in the chat. The person is greater than the player, and there's no doubt. I think that is really something that we're, I feel like people are waking up to and to, your point, all your points, Joan, about how critical it is we have balance, that we're aware, that we have good habits, that to your point, Dr. Uh, Armand, about nutrition and hydration and how all these things collectively, when they come together, they could do this, yeah. if not done right, but they could also do this. And I think it's obviously we're looking for this, that harmony. Um, and you know, to my injuries, again, I had one contact, one non-contact, um, and I had done a, a, an action many, many, many times in my career leading up to the time I had the non-contact injury. And, you know, I think sometimes you're just not going to prevent some of those things. You know, these are unfortunate circumstances. Is that is that incorrect or is that is that appropriate to say? Correct. You know, injury prevention is never going to limit all injuries. You know, they're going to be ACL injuries, you know, um, but but it certainly can decrease the number. And that, that's what that's what the goal is. You know, while, you know, the treatments are getting better. I mean, there's going to be a time, you know, where we don't you know what I don't do ACL surgeries. But I, I think I do believe there's going to be a time when. The, the grafts won't be necessary and repairs will be an option and tightening up a loose ligament may be an option. We're just not quite there yet, but, uh, but, but we can certainly decrease the number of all of these things we're talking about. Okay. So I have, I've kept you now for 40 minutes and I said, I wouldn't go too long. I want you, Dr. Joan and you, Dr. Armand to give us one takeaway, one action item, that everybody listening here can either take back for themselves or give to a coach or give to their their daughter or son or player that you feel will help them in this journey to navigate um, I, I would say wellness because you know we being injured is like now what do we do it's retroactive now we have to make some actions but what can we do before um, that you'd like to um, leave the audience with I think the one thing I would emphasize, whether it's for athletic activities or everyday life, is neuromuscular education, neuromuscular training, you know, because that's what will keep you healthy and to do the things and it will give you the it will give you the mobility, it will give you the strength. And, you know, and you know, look, I see a, a lot of, you know, older patients as well and and if you want, if you want the secret, you know, you know, the quote unquote secret of, of, of longevity, it's, it's, you know, basically you need, you need strength and you need flexibility. You, you need both. Um, and, you know, the, the strength training, whether it's through, through elastic bands or, you know, we, we haven't mentioned it a bit, but when we do strength training, you know, when I was young, we always just did 
uh, concentric strengthening. You, well, we did, you know, stay away from the from the machines and the weights. Simple things, bands, you know, like I said, free weights, uh, milk cartons. You know, that's what will give you the strength that you need, not the machines that you go into a gym for, because they're they're only strengthening in one direction, and you want to strengthen the muscle in both directions. Randy is muted. Uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, my, my puppy was barking. Okay, uh, Dr. Arman, your turn. Yeah, your turn. Um, uh, neuromuscular is, 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 is the number one thing, I believe, as well, too, the balance. And, and I think um, a lot of the kids can incorporate nutrition and, and hydration in, in, their, in their daily uh, routine. I think that will translate into the next stage of their competitiveness in going into more you know, high school, college, and pro. Um, the other thing is, is whatever you're doing, like Joan was saying, if you're at home, just do take a band next to you, just do little exercises here and there, just strengthen that specific core muscle. Um, that's the other part that I would, I would follow up. There you go. See that? That's perfect. Just have it next to you. Just like, you know, uh, always have it right by, by, by your side. You know, a lot of our athletes, we just have them, we put them in a little bag and they carry it every day with them. So those, those are the couple of things you need to incorporate in your daily um, type of uh, activities. Awesome. 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 Um, I know I've been looking through the questions. Um, I've been looking through the chat. I feel like we've um, gotten to everybody's interest. If there's any one, if there is a question that is burning you up, please ask it now before it's time for us to say uh, farewell to these wonderful physicians who have, given us their very valuable time. Um, and so um, I would like to say thank you so very much. Wish you all the best in your journeys. Please, everybody, I'm going to plug again uh, Doc Olaf shoes because not only are they beautiful, they function and they're comfortable. You know, women, you do not need to suffer or hurt for um, uh, for your aesthetic um, desires of looking good. Uh, so that's important. Uh, out there, oh, I have a question. Will Cap Macario recover in time for the World Cup? The US team prays that she will be ready. Uh, they pr she, they must be praying that she will be ready. Hopefully she will, um, she will have uh, the ability to get back on the field like Alexius Buteus. Oh, I have two questions. Hot shots for the doctors. You ready? You ready? Clogs or Crocs? Clogs. Clogs. <laughs> well, I thought, no. So would chefs say the same thing? Clogs? You, what is no, it clogs? No, 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 because no. You, it, the, you want the stability. So uh, clocks, you know, the, are just too flexible. And, and that's a good, you know, that's a good thing. Even when we're looking at shoes, like when you're looking at athletic shoes, like high performance, you know, athletic mm -hmm. shoes are well made, right? But what are people wearing? They're wearing, they're wearing Rothies or or Allbirds and, and and or Skechers. And if you flex the shoe, like if you have a, you know, if you have a sneaker, it, you shouldn't be able to flex it. If you can like get it to, you know, come up on itself, it's too flexible. What does yeah, that mean? What does that mean physiologically if it does that? It, it you're stressing your your forefoot and your midfoot. That's oh. why you get you know pain underneath the ball, your foot. You know, um, it, it's just not stable. That was an interesting question you brought, Brandy. I think the question when you ask the youth, like the younger population, they're definitely going to pick the, the 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 Crocs over the clocks. But when you're talking about the uh, the flexibility, you know, this past year I've seen people who wear those. Um, uh, the, the shoes that have the toes and there's absolutely kind of the no stability to it. I've seen like five stress fractures um, come up with that. That's a whole okay. Well, they should remember whole that. Topic, yeah. <laughs> craze, and we saw more patients from that than anything else. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Well, so the more you know is true. The more <laughs> you know, the better we can be. So again, the action items are the neuromuscular training. Have your bands around you at all times. When you're sitting at your desk, I mean, I know sitting is the next smoking, so I've heard. Um, so let's try and do some things while we are in that sitting mode that might help us. Um, sleep, 
Um, I will get a discount code for everybody who attended today for a mummy pillow if you are so interested. Um, Rachel will send that out to you all. Thank you, um, if you if you do go to the site and share it with anybody you know. Again, doctors, thank you so much for your intelligence, your experience, um, and your desire to help people live healthier. You know, you you need patients, but you also want people to be healthy. So I appreciate you telling them ways to stay healthy and out of your offices. So um, th that is very nice. So we hope that everybody will come back um, to Brandy's Corner for the part two, uh, which Rachel will make sure that you know about. And we look forward to coming together again. Thank you all for joining Brandy's Corner. Go out, be awesome, and be strong. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate yeah. it.